It is October 20th. This is episode 92 of This Week in BJJ. Today, we're going to talk about the two live events that happened last weekend and also a special guest, Lucas Leach. So all month long, you heard me talking about a couple live events. Last weekend was amazing. I went to Missouri, to St. Louis, at the Moto Museum to do the commentary for Respect 2. Respect is the leading uh, super fight event in the Midwest, and we had 16 super fights. It was an amazing event. I don't want to give anything away, but I am wearing a Megaton t-shirt today. So uh, he had a great uh, fight in the uh, co main event against uh, Chris Howder. It was really cool. There's a lot you can learn from watching that match. Also, uh, Gianni Grippo had a short match against uh, Jeff Curran. Uh, I'm not going to give anything away. Um, but, uh, man, so many great matches. Just to name a few, uh, Clay Mayfield was a Hoist Gracie brown belt. He took on uh, Kirk Huff. That was really cool. Nick Schrock versus John Gouda was a great matchup. Jenna Bishop and Karen Antunas back and forth the whole time. Uh, Sean Woods versus Omar French. Sean won the submission of the night uh, with a wrist lock. And, um, yeah, it was just a great event. And uh, it's now available at a discounted price of $14.95 on Budo Video. So if you didn't catch it live, now you can catch the replay. And it'll be available for about 30 days. So if you get it now, you'll be able to watch it for uh, almost 30 more days. So check out budovideos.com slash respect2. And thanks again, guys. You did a great job um, to the organizers of the event and the competitors. It was really cool. The other event that happened last weekend was the Abu Dhabi Grand Slam Los Angeles. This event was beautiful. Uh, unfortunately, I wasn't able to make it there live, but I did catch the broadcast that uh, that we put on. And uh, man, those guys spared no expense. Um, you know, the people in Abu Dhabi did a beautiful job. It was a great event. And uh, it's still available for free. Just go to buddhavideos.com slash Grand Slam. You can see all the action from all day long, including uh, Cyborg. Cyborg did a great uh, performance there in the Absolute Division. You can see him doing a really cool throw. Uh, Ude Gaeshi throw is the name of it, and uh, it's one of my favorites. And it's not one that you see too often in Jiu-Jitsu, um, but it's really cool. You should definitely check it out if you haven't seen it yet. So now it is time for... The uh, special interview and techniques by Lucas Leitch. Lucas is a guy that I've known for a long time, and I've always wanted to get him on the show. Uh, we finally managed to bring him in, and Lucas is an amazing half guard player. He has a unique way of doing the half guard. It's different than most other people, but it's interesting when I asked him where he learned this particular style of half guard. Uh, so pay attention to that. And uh, the techniques that he shows are somewhat basic, but a very unique. Again, he has a very unique way of doing it. So pay attention to his legs, to his footwork, what he's doing. Uh, I think you're going to enjoy this one. So here we are, an interview and techniques with Lucas Leach. Lucas, thanks for coming on the show today. Thank you. <laughs> so I was happy to be in your hometown of Sao Paulo for the 2015 ADCC. And um, you know, there's a lot of superstars in jiu-jitsu that come from your city. What is it about Sao Paulo that's generating all these champions? Uh, I think Sao Paulo have a, a lot of opportunities to work and good sponsorships and we also we don't have beach like <laughs> Rio so after the school everybody go to the Jiu Jitsu Academy people then like Jiu Jitsu you know I think uh, Sao Paulo come with this new Jiu Jitsu how we can say like the, the nerd Jiu Jitsu where people train in the morning afternoon and night where I believe have a lot of guys from Rio but you know than doing that too, but one city like Rio, it's so nice outdoor and beach. You don't want to be at inside the gym three o'clock afternoon, and, you know. I think that that make a little bit difference, you know. Sao Paulo guys doesn't, especially where in the country, Sao Paulo and small cities around Sao Paulo, where I come in Cobrinha, Mendes, Miaus, doesn't have too much to do, and you know, it's hot. Doesn't have not too much to do it like outdoor, like go to the beach or ocean, doesn't have surfing. So I think that help to the new generation stay on the mat. And, and that's what make you a champion these days, you know, like before we have world champions, they just train three, four times a week. You know, right now for you be a world champion in the blue belt, you need to, you need to train three, four times a day, mm -hmm. you know. So, For sure. 
Yeah, so yeah, like what you're saying is there's less distractions in Sao Paulo, uh, so you can really focus on your training. What do you think, what does it take to be a champion nowadays? You mentioned you can't just train a few times a week, it has to be a few times a day, but what do those trainings need to consist of? How important is drilling in, in your whole, and your weekly schedule? I think uh, a couple different points to be a champion, you need you need to have a good instructor, of course, to, to make you like compete. Not, you don't need to be a world champion, the best instructor, but your first instructor need to be someone that make you like to compete, you know, don't make you uncomfortable, go to a competition like, oh my God, I'm scary to my instructor, you know? That's the first point. Then how much you want that, you know, because it's easy you blame your coach or the academy, but you know, you really need want to be a champion because it's not nice training to be a champion. It's nice training three times a week when your body feel good to train, you know, but training three times a day, you know, sometimes your fingers hurt, your ears hurt, you know, your joints hurt and you need to train again. So you need really once, you know, you don't gonna be, even when you train if the best coach in the world, if you really don't want, if you don't sacrifice yourself, you know, don't, and don't believe, don't think it's going to be nice, the training, you know, some days you don't want to be there. And so you need, really want. Another point is your partners, you know, find partners then, you know, going to make you go to the next level. You know, I think, I believe you need some guys, then you're going to be better than them for you can try new things. You, you also need sparring guys, then you're going to work your defense. Like if you, you know, train if you Roger Grace, you, you're just going to defend. And also, and it's very important for a competition, we train if guys then are same level than you, because that's going to be what you're going to find on the competition probably, at least after the third match, you know. Guys then, uh, we're going to battle for one vantage, for one score, for one, you know. And I think all these kind of trainings together, more have a, you know, you need to have sponsorships to pay all this competition because you know it's gonna be it's gonna be a lot of money you know if you wanna compete you don't gonna be a, you don't gonna be a world champion in the first tournament. You need to compete a lot of tournaments. After one, two years then you find yourself doing better in the competition. So that's what I think you you need, you know, a good coach. Um, you need really one to do that and partners part sparring partners then it's gonna be the they, they won the same thing, the same, same than you. All very good points, Lucas. So you're a member of uh, the team Checkmat, and uh, long-time Jiu-Jitsu fans know that that's a relatively new team uh, being led by Leo Vieira. Has Leo always been your coach? He was not my first coach. Um, I started training for high and grace when I was small, but uh, then I moved to a different city, training for another guy, Marcelo. And then when I was the end of my blue belt, I, I signed up to Leo Academy. Leo moved from Rio to Sao Paulo. And, but that's what I'm saying about like Ryan Hyan was a very good coach. And another, the Marcelo was a good coach, but Leo is the one that makes me like to compete, you know? So I remember Ryan Grace's school were more uh, you know, they love compete, but, you know, he was more busy to have more students back then than Leo. He didn't give too many attention. He didn't make sure, oh, you want to compete. If you want to compete, you compete. If you not, you not. But Leo was the guy that, hey, Lucas, why you don't compete? I said, ah, Leo, I don't know. Yeah, let's go. He, me, he bring me to Rio, you know, and he was like, a, he have a girlfriend. He doesn't go out too much. And back then I was like on oh my 16, 17, I was between, you know, like training for fun and, and, and go to the clubs. And Leo started showing me like, oh, if you want to be a champ, you know, come and train Saturday. Oh, I went to train Saturday. Oh, let's go compete next week in small tournament. So I went to there. So I started, he making me like compete and like the athlete lifestyle, not just the Jiu Jitsu lifestyle, but being an athlete, you know, doing functional training, wake up early, don't go out, these kind of things, he helped me a lot. I see. You have a lot of super talented teammates. Um, I've enjoyed watching your trainings with uh, guys like uh, Bouchesh, uh, like Jackson Souza, Joe Alassis, Yuri Simoes, uh, who used to be one of your team mem teammates. Who of these guys did you go through the ranks with? Who was your longest teammate and friend? 
<laughs> from this these guys is a new generation than me, huh? Buchecha, Yuri. I think it was Robert Drysdale, André Galvão, and, but now we are a different team, huh? Mm -hmm. Marcel Lozada. This was the guys then, and Damian Meyer. That, that was the guys then, they was, they was not my coach as a Leo, but they are always upper belt than me, and I always learn a lot of these four guys, Leo, André, uh, Robert, and Damian Maia. This was during the Brasa days? Yeah, it was in the Brasa days. So, you know, I remember I, me and Robert and Andre, it was after the Leo class, we was rolling just me, Andre, and Robert for hours, you know. And Marcel Lozada too, you guys remember mm -hmm. Marcel Lozada too? Yes, and La Pella mm -hmm. too. We, but he, he, he coming from to Leo when he was a brown belt. Yeah, but basically, the guys then I then helped me a lot with my jiu-jitsu and I always try focus on them is Leo, André Galvão, Robert and Damien. They yeah, I always looking forward to be like them. So most people that have followed your competition career know that you are an amazing half guard player. And there are some people out there that don't like half guard. They think half guard is halfway to getting your guard passed. Why do you like the half guard? Uh, you know, it was natural for me. I don't have too much flexibility, so I always had a hard time to play spider and invert guard. And I always, like, love no gi. And, you know, before I was a little bit knucklehead when I was young, so I remember going to jiu-jitsu. I was doing my Thai jiu-jitsu, boxing. And when I, I want to do MMA before. So every time that I learned something on the call, on the leaves, I was thinking, oh, no, that don't work no, don't work no gi. And I think the half guard coming natural for me, you know. I don't play too much the, you know, the, the deep half. You guys see how I compete. I go sometimes to the deep, but normally my half guard is more aggressive going outside. I don't stay with my back on the floor and wait too much. I always try to go outside, inside, always try to search for the back. And uh, I understand why people believe on that because I'm as a black belt. When someone roll with me and want to play half guard, I love. I love pass half guard. Every black belt loves to pass half guard. But we, I also always compete with guys that have a good half guard. And I get swept like Celcinho Vinicius, you know, uh, and other guys from the team that I compete before. And they, you know, some guys have good sweep in the half guard, sweep from half guard. And naturally, I started using that because it wasn't game. B mainly because I think it's a game that you can use a gi as a no gi without you change too much your game. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and early on in my training, I, I really liked that idea too. Marcelo might have been the first guy I heard that from, Marcelo Garcia, saying that why have two different games? Just have one for gi and no gi, then you don't have to get confused about your grips or anything like that. But I wonder, does having one game for a gi and no gi, does that hurt your gi game? You know, if you're not using the lapels, then you're limiting your options. Yes. Ah. <laughs> I don't know. I, even inside the half guard, of course, there's a difference. Mm -hmm. Like, on my, the way that I like to play, as an example, I think it's easier to set up without the gi, but once I set up, it's easier with the gi. Mm. You know, it makes sense. It's hard to uh, get in my position with gi because of all the grips. Mm. But once I get there with gi, it's so hard to the guy escape. You know, sometimes the, with no gi, he slide off. But even everybody need adapt the different. Like I love choke from the mount and choke from the back. No gi doesn't have these chokes. Mm. So when you change Kimura and bar. So, like with Gi, I always choke oh, the classic terere choke. You know, one, pass this, like the bow and other choke, just, just with the grips. Mm -hmm. With no Gi, I don't have too much of this option. So I start to work more the Kimura, Kimura to arm bar. Mm -hmm. These little things, you know. I think with Gi, you can make more mistakes. Yeah, with no Gi, you're able to make more mistakes and scramble. You scramble and, fix yourself. Right. 
You mentioned Deep Half Guard. Um, you know, we've seen in recent years Bernardo Faria using Deep Half Guard at the highest level and winning almost every match, at least in this year, with it. Does that make you think differently about maybe using more Deep Half Guard? I use deep. I like going to the deep from the X. I know all positions, not all, but I know what kind of game Bernardo doing. João and Cis have a very similar game, and I always come train with him. And I use two. I just, I don't know, I just don't feel comfortable. You change the lapel. You know, games sometimes you need feeling comfortable. Like the way that João and Bernardo stay here for the lapel and come on top. I don't know, my shoulders get tired. I use it a lot. What he does, he pass the lapel, grab the another leg, do the one that he ain't mm. inside. I use this one too. Yeah, I don't, I just curious to see what game he does in his half guard without the gi. Mm. Because he uses a lot of his lapel yep. and I love his game. I just I just was angry how he how he played. Probably he like play a little bit my game sometimes going outside because we don't have the lapel. Mm. But man, half guard is always there. I know people you don't need like, you know, like I love watching, you know, uh, the warm guard, mm -hmm. but I don't like to do it, you know, but I like to watch. Okay. Some guys don't like beating bolo and other guys like. I think if everything then works for you, why you don't do it? And if it's legal, it's not dirty, why don't use, you know? Right. But sometimes when I visit academies, I'll see a guy like Nino Shembri, for example. He has great omoplatas. But not all of his students have good omoplatas. Even though that's his specialty, he doesn't push it on his students. Other guys like the Mendes brothers, they love De La Hiva, Baron Bolo, so almost all of their students, they, they push that on them and they become good at those positions. You're great at the half guard. Do you guide your students to the half guard or do you teach everything and let them choose what they like? I prefer to teach everything. Of course, all guys then try to learn from me, especially than higher belts. Is already guys then like half guard, you know, like even when I do seminars, most of the guys are already guys then have over 32 and they always like half guard and when they see one guy like me, like Bernardo, competes on the high level and use that game they love, you know, they feel, like, oh, if, if Bernardo is able to, to win the world champions, an open class, doing half guard, so I'm okay too, because, you know, half guard is one game that is easy to do it, As, like, it's easy to learn. A lot of blue belts, purple belts, uh, special blue belts, they are kind of lost in what kind of grips they're going to use to, to control the guy. And half guard, they lock their foot, they enter there, and they can breathe and work a little bit. So, have a lot of people then play half guard on the jiu-jitsu. Maybe not on the black belt to do high level, but if you travel and visit different academies, you know, jiu-jitsu and what is so nice about jiu-jitsu, have space for everyone, you know. Like, so, a lot of guys over 30, 35, you know, they don't have more the, the flexibility or the spine to keep doing inverse they want to learn but doing the uh, like like i was talking to you when when he finds someone then same level than him mm -hmm. they lock in the half guard you know like lockdown position everybody love the lockdown <laughs> position because it's easy to do it you hold and you can hold the, even a, a, a 10 times black belt world champion you hold at least for a 30 seconds you're gonna hold I don't want to be able to escape from this lockdown right away like magic, you know, I need, you know. So I see a lot of guys and then a lot of guys are going to do seminars and they, they see I'm, I'm doing, I'm doing a little bit different. I don't do too much lockdown. I don't stay there. Even though I think it's easier to the guys learn than my guard, you know. So some guys they like, some guys they get a little bit old, but I thought you're going to, play more this lockdown and say, yeah, but it's not my game, you know. Mm -hmm. I want to teach what I'm doing. I, I'm working more going to the back, going to the back. Mm -hmm. Always try, find the back attack. And by they scary the back, they, they end up to give me the, the position. What I think is good, I see, not good, but what I like about my game, and people don't understand, they think I'm just the only, I just won by a half guard. But if you see my mats, I used to have guard to get a better position and then control all the mats. 
So that's something that I, I, I always try to teach the guys, and I love to do it, is the controlling the guy. You don't see, I'm not a, a, a natural finisher that go to a submission from everywhere. You know, who saw me compete knows. I'm one guy that I love to finish, but I always finish after I control. Mm -hmm. like 90% of my finish, on my, all my career, I was on the back, or in the mount, or in the side control. You don't see me, like, that don't mean it's always good, or it's just my style, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think the half guard helped me to when I got the sweat, I'm already on the side, and then going to the back, and that's, is when I is when I able to apply my game that control you see like these last Pan Ams I compete as a heavy weight and I didn't have too much submissions but I was able to control all my mats like by the end of the match I was in the mount I was in the back I was in the side control and the guys was like heavy weight so and every control coming from the the way that I swept I swept and I already was in the side. Mm -hmm. Even though they don't give you the three points, who cares? I'm mean, there, he turned to the third position, boom. I go to the back and then, then I stay there. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to ask you, wh when you think back on your competition career so far, uh, what's the most memorable match? And before you answer that, you know, I, I've seen so many of your matches and the time that you looked the happiest that I remember was when you were fighting Crone Gracie. I knew. <laughs> yes. I think that Matt was, uh, it was a lot of things involved. I, 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 already, I already was a Pan Am's black belt champion mm -hmm. in 07 as a lightweight. But people, some people talk about, some people, you know, I was just a new upper coming. Oh, this guy won the lightweight. Well, of course, when you beat someone as a crone, you know, he coming, even then I was more experienced than him. He have a big name, mm -hmm. he and his dad and his family, you know, of course was everybody looking look at him. Couple guys knew me. I was older than him as a black belt. I already was a champion. If you put on the line, you know, he was the challenge, you know. Mm -hmm. I already have a Pan Am's title and a world title. But, you know, it was Chrome Grace, everybody was waiting because he have a very aggressive style and have a lot of submissions, you know, very exciting to watch him. I still love watching him. But, and also I was just moved from Brazil, so I was kind of lost here. Not lost, but, you know, I, I was, you know, try make my name here in America. So it was like, oh. And people that don't, that weren't around at that time, 2007, Crone was killing everybody at Brown Belt. Hardly any of his matches went over one or two minutes, you know, and he was getting guys in knee bars and, and arm, lock, arm bars and chokes, doing everything. He was, in most people's eyes, unbeatable at that point. Yeah. So. Please continue. Yeah, so, yeah, and I remember we, we did like, what, four mats each. I was winning, I submit two guys, but the, the another two guys was by points, was a hard mat. You know, one guy is like Felipe Preguiça brother. Mm -hmm. You know, Cristiano Chico. Chichi. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was like a crazy mat. <laughs> and Crow was finished, everybody. So I was thinking, oh my God, what I, you know, what I gonna expect it? But, you know, I, like I'm saying, all my sparring partners give me a lot of confidence. Say, you know what, I train for Andre, Robert, every day, you know. But he got my back. He got my back and, and I, like in the beginning of the match, he got my back and I, everybody was crown, crown, crown. I think, what I think is when I escaped from his back, he's kind of, he got tired, emotional and physical. Like, because I never seen him lose a back before. I always see him going to the back and <laughs> going to the back. So he did the four points, but he couldn't finish me. I escaped and I swept him. So it was four, two, and I put pressure, put pressure. Then we both stand up, he pushed me. I saw he was kind of nervous. Then I double leg and pass his guard. Yeah, it was a good match Yeah, for my car. Yeah, it's one of the best. I remember after you passed his guard, you could just see his energy just draining away. You know, yes. he was so confident in the beginning, but you know, anybody in a match like that is gonna lose confidence after, after a while. So is that your, your most memorable match to date? Uh, also, you guys don't know, because against Lucas Lepri as a brown belt world champion final, we did a final after five matches, so it was our sixth match. 
lightweight brown belt 2005 final and it was me and Lepri and was my first world champion title mm. so and I coming from a knee surgery like four months ago a meniscus not too serious but and I did did the awesome I think it was like 12 12 two for me I was in his back and that was making me decide to leave off jiu-jitsu 12 to 2 you won that yes wow <laughs> Wow. I'll have to go back and watch that match. Yeah. I don't know if you guys are going to find I never find this one. Was mm. a, a lot of brown belt. Calazans was in the bracket. A lot of guys was in the bracket. Mm. Wow. 